Living in this tiny house has increased my quality of life exponentially. And every day when I come in my front door, I feel like I'm home. I'm Carol. I live in a tiny house called the Dragon's Nest. I built it myself in 2019. I was supposed to have help, but COVID. And so I ended up building it alone. I don't mind because I now know every single nail and screw and piece of glue that's in this house. And I can fix anything that goes wrong with it because I did it all myself. I've been living here for three years and I live off grid in a beautiful forested area on Vancouver Island. The theme of my house is an 1800s Roma Vardo wagon. And so all the antiques either were built in the 1800s or are 1800s style. The Vardo itself is an 1800s style and I'm an artist. So I want color and I want pattern and I want texture. And so for me, this home is absolutely perfect. It might not be for someone else, but someone else doesn't have to live in it right now. Just me. <laughs> Throughout my life, I have lived in 4,800 square foot homes all the way down to 1,100 square foot. But I decided to live in a tiny house because I really didn't need all that space. So I downsized and I started gathering materials in 2016. I gathered reclaimed items, I gathered garage sale finds, and I began to plan the tiny house on paper. I started to look at acquiring a trailer at a price that I could afford, and a friend who's a truck driver called me up and said, if you don't buy this, flat deck trailer. I'm going to buy it. It's a scream of a deal. It's a commercial earth moving machinery hauler. So I bought it and I started to frame it up. That was in 2018. And by the time I was ready with material enough to build it, we had COVID and no one could help me at that time. So I ended up building it all by myself. I had helped to put in the bathroom window because the window was just too ungainly for me to put in by myself and I had help to put in the very front window as well. I had to move it out of the municipality that said they were going to tow it and dismantle it to somewhere where I could continue the build. It took me about a year to build it because I wanted to make sure that I paid cash for things that I had to buy new like plumbing, the electrical wire, and the propane appliances. It's all new. And I paid for inspections and had all my work certified. So I guess my philosophy was make it as safe and as correct as possible. I was able to actually build my home, trailer cost and everything included for under $20,000 because I was very judicious in scrounging and reclaiming and getting things at the best possible price I could get them for and reusing things that I already owned. This book is my history of the dragon's nest. It has every single receipt so that I was able to track how much money I was spending on building my tiny house. I have volunteered for years with Habitat for Humanity and built houses in Alberta, in Ontario, and helped with builds here in British Columbia. And so I had some acquired skills, but I owe my building skills to my brother-in-law, Gary. This house is 320 square feet. It measures nine and a half feet by 38 feet interior. The exterior of the home is board and batten primarily, made from dimensional milled Douglas fir. And then I have cedar shingles as an accent on the outside of the home. And every cedar shingle is cut in a dragon scale. The front of the Vardo is a great room. 
So my great room has my living area at the very front. Then my dining area is a table and a couple of chairs and it folds out to make a larger dining table and the kitchen area. I built the great room because I wanted a big open space that would be easy to move around in. The ceiling in the great room is comprised of panels that I purchased from Upper Canada Village. They had a Victorian tin plate pressing machine and they pressed these tin plates. Everything in this home has a story to it and all the pieces have basically come from the home I lived in before. I loved to collect antiques. Varda wagons all have a nook bed. So I found a box bed at a price that I could afford. I took the front and used it for the front of my nook bed. And I took the other three sides and used them as paneling in the bedroom. So I was able to create the bedroom that I really wanted to have, that I just absolutely love being in. One piece that's in the house that was one of my antiques that ended up being refurbished is the toilet, which was created by a lovely woodworking young fellow. I showed him a bunch of pictures of 1800s bucket toilets, essentially, and said, could you build that? And he did. I'm completely off grid and I don't have internet or cellular connection here at my home. So I have to haul all my own water in. I haul it in and then I store it in large water totes and a pump brings the water from the water tote into the house. It goes first through a water treatment system which uses cartridges. I have to change those cartridges roughly every six months. I garner most of my electricity from solar panels and I use a Titan power station with a battery set up and I need four hours of sun power to fully charge the batteries. When I don't get enough sun power, I have to recharge the batteries using a generator. So when the batteries are filled, I get three days of power. I use a ventless propane heater approved for use in mobile homes and it heats the 320 square feet very amply. I have a gray water pond. I don't use any phosphates at all. I use all natural cleansers. I don't have to worry about taking care of black water waste because I use a composting toilet. I would say the only negative to living in a tiny house is that the local municipalities and the provincial and federal government don't recognize well-built tiny homes as being valid living spaces for 24-7 occupancy. So finding a place to park a tiny home has been very difficult. And so when I was finished my tiny house, I went in search of somewhere to park it. I partnered up with the landowner where I'm now parked and we made an agreement and signed a contract for me to live on his land. Because we are in a gray area for zoning here, it isn't legal for me to live in my tiny house, but it isn't illegal either. So I'm just in that gray area until the province determines how they're going to handle the housing crisis. It's more difficult to find somewhere to park a tiny house if you have livestock. <laughs> and I have livestock. I have three miniature carriage horses and I teach carriage driving using the tiny miniature horses. I also have two Toggenberg goats and hope to get my own goat's milk and start making my own cheese again and my own yogurts. I have my own chickens 
and I raise them for the eggs. I eat about a dozen eggs a week and anything they produce in excess of that I can sell. I also have heritage breed turkeys. <laughs> However, this group of turkey babies looks like they're all gonna be girls, so I might keep them for the eggs. Turkey eggs are amazing. I keep bees and I raise my bees very naturally. I don't use smoke to calm them. I just talk to them every day and they get used to my voice and so I can go out at any time and just be with my bees and they're all calm as long as I'm talking to them. I have a Langstroth long box beehive so it runs horizontally and will hold two hives. This is a typical beekeeping outfit that the beekeepers wore in Middle Ages to Medieval times. I don't normally wear any gear to work with my bees, but I made this in particular for a little competition that I'm entering with the Society for Creative Anachronism. I am retired. I'm approaching 70. I have lupus, so I can't really commit to a full time job because sometimes if I have a lupus flare-up I just can't come to work and I'm living on my Canada pension which is a bit of a challenge. But I love to volunteer. I volunteer for the local food bank and I am the volunteer coordinator for that food bank. I also still volunteer with Habitat for Humanity. I volunteer at the ReStore and I go in once a week and I'm pretty much their all-around person. I have a Facebook page, The Dragon's Nest, where I publish articles on how to live in a tiny house and how to live off grid. I'm very willing to advise people on what pitfalls to avoid and what's out there and available to build a tiny home. Over the summer months, it costs me only my rent to live here, which is very low. Over the winter, my expenses go up about 20% to cover the fuels that I need for the generator and the propane for the tankless hot water heater and the house heater. I know for certain that I could not rent 320 square feet anywhere as affordably. So living here is worth what it costs me. Now, if that means sometimes I have to eat a lot of rice or pork, then so be it. I don't want to mislead anybody into thinking that it was easy to get here into this tiny home. It took an awful lot of work to gather up the materials in a way that was affordable for me. Building the tiny house itself was a tremendous amount of work. I had the building codes that I had to comply with because when and if tiny houses become legal, I have my entire build documented so that I can say I followed every single building code to the letter and you have to consider the weight that the trailer frame and wheels and axles can handle. So as you're building, you have to be constantly considering, oh, a two by four weighs this much and a sheet of plywood weighs this much so that it can travel and be moved from place to place if that's your aim. When I had just completed the shell and I had not completed the interior and winter was coming, and I sat down on the floor and I started to cry. And I thought, it's taking too much of my energy. It's taking too much from me. It's too hard. But then I went to one of my SCA events and had a weekend off and came back refreshed and started to put the finish on the walls. And then it started to feel more like a home. It's a lot of work to build your own tiny house, but it is absolutely worth it. Every blister, every cut, every bruise, every sore muscle that went into building this house 
made me a miniature paradise that I absolutely love to come home to. Subscribe to Exploring Alternatives and please share this video if you liked it. You can also follow Carol on her Facebook page and on her website. Thanks for watching.